may be seated. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 14. Today, the Lord willing, we'll be looking at verses 15 through 20. Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 through 20. And as you're turning there, we remember that a couple of weeks ago I passed out copies of the wrong map of the Exodus found in most standard Bibles. And then I passed out copies of a correct map of where actually the land of Goshen was located. It was during the 18th dynasty, and we know where the capital of Egypt was at that time. It was in the area of Thebes and Luxor and Karnak, which is 480 miles south on the Nile River, not up near the delta where you have the children of Israel wandering through the swamp marshes down onto the Sinai Peninsula, but 480 miles south so that a genuine miracle has to take place. We saw that there were two routes going from the Karnak, Luxor, Thebes area over toward the Red Sea at a place where the Red Sea is 118 miles wide. A genuine miracle takes place. It was not that the children of Israel were traveling light and waded through the mud and Pharaoh's chariots got stuck in the mud. A genuine miracle takes place at the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, last week I also passed out those maps again, the bad map. So you've got two copies of the bad map, one copy of the good map, plus on the back of the good map, you remember I've given you an aerial view of the Thebes, Luxor, Karnak area and all the different tombs that are located, all the tombs of the kings who were there during the 18th dynasty and the tombs of Hatshepsut and others, very important in our narrative today. So you saw not only the map the first time with all the question marks, where all the places that are mentioned in our immediate text are not located because they all have question marks by them. No remains have ever been found there. But the second time around, I gave you a long list out of Numbers chapter 33, which was Moses' personal list, his personal record, of every place the children of Israel stopped over the 40-year period in the wilderness. And we saw that there were more than 40 locations not just the few that the liberals want you to try to believe are there on the Sinai Peninsula. There are over 40 different locations that Moses gives in Numbers chapter 33 where he makes it very, very clear that that is where the children of Israel stop. That's an average of one place per year. At least 2 million people, I think closer to 6 million people, camped out for a year at 40 different places and none of those places has ever been found on the Sinai Peninsula. No remnants, no trace. That many people would leave some trace if that's where, in fact, they were. We talked about how the entire western side of the Sinai Peninsula would have been impossible for the children of Israel to go on down that side because at this period in history, that entire side was lined with copper and turquoise mines controlled by the Egyptians. But as we read in our text today, Moses said, look, when we get across the sea, you're never going to see the Egyptians again. Well, they saw dead ones, but they didn't see any living Egyptians. They didn't have to fight their way down the western side of the Sinai Peninsula to get all the way to the bottom to reach Mount Sinai and then go up on top of the, the mountain where St. Catherine's Monastery is located, the Greek Orthodox Monastery, where a bunch of manuscripts were found which were defective texts and which replaced, as you know, those of you who know a little bit about the textual uh, effort, uh, were used to replace the text that underlies the King James Version of the Bible. Lots of funny things going down there at the southern point of Sinai, but not the Exodus. And we saw all the different places that they stopped along the way. God declares in that passage in number 33 that the reason for the Exodus was that he could declare his mighty power against the gods of the Egyptians. God had just destroyed all the gods of Egypt when you go through that entire list. And if you just glance at it, you see this huge list of names. We'll not go through them all again today. The space that Israel took up, we talked about how much space that would have been. It gave us a description of the area, which is about 10 miles by 10 miles for the camp of Israel. And we talked about how that would be related to the civilization or the population of Philadelphia. The population of Philadelphia today is 1,567,000. That's one and a half million. Even the liberals 
agree that there must have been at least two million Jews. If there were six million, how big would have their camp been? They could have been at least four or five times as large as the city of Philadelphia in terms of their population. We talked about who was the pharaoh of the Exodus. We'll not go over that again. We talked about during the 40 years of wandering, more babies were born. The numbers were growing. In fact, it says that in our text today also. The children of Israel wanted babies, even though the men of war were dying off. We'll see that in another passage that I want to look at today in the book of Deuteronomy, where we get more hints concerning the Exodus, concerning the numbers, concerning their locations, concerning the things that they were doing. They were having many, many babies during the wilderness wanderings not just the 1.8 babies that the liberals want you to believe in which the population control people think is the right number for us here in the United States, which is a population that will actually shrink, not grow. We talk about how scary it would be if you went up one morning and saw across the river six million people armed to the teeth, ready to cross the river and ready to destroy you because that's what their God had told them to do. We tend to think of the Exodus in way too small terms. God did a major miracle when he brought the children of Israel out. Remember, we challenged you also to try to figure out what Paul was talking about when he told us that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. It's in Arabia. It's not in the Sinai Peninsula. And if you want to look it up in Greek, one of our people asked me last week, are you sure that the word that Paul uses in the book of Galatians, when he says that Sinai is in Arabia, is actually Arabia. Yes, in fact, you can sound it out in Greek, and you know what it says? Arabia. <laughs> it's not a different word that somehow got mistranslated Arabia. It's the word Arabia. Yes. Mount Sinai is in Arabia. It's not in the Sinai Peninsula. And so uh, that brings us to today. Light in the darkest night. And we find God now speaking to Moses. The children of Israel just yelled and screamed and complained at Moses and they're jumping up and down and pounding their feet, you know, and stamping and, you know, acting like children having a temper tantrum. They're terrified. They're horrified. Here are the Egyptians running behind them. They have very few weapons, if any at all. They've gone out. They've been very arrogant about it. It says they went out with a high hand. Remember we talked about that, how that's like, so what you guys going to do about it, you Egyptians? Go bury your dead. We talked about how that would have taken some time for the Egyptians. Every one of the households was mourning a firstborn dead. Some households were mourning two firstborn deads because the husband or the wife in that household might have been a firstborn. That firstborn son, they had to go through some rituals. They had to prepare. They had to bury their dead. So Israel got their act together and they made it all the way to the sea. But Pharaoh says, we're not going to let them get out of here. We just let our entire slave population go. You know what that means for the rest of us? The rest of us going to have to work. Are we tired of working? Yeah, we're tired of working. We don't want to work. Make them work. And they killed a bunch of our people. We'll get them for that. Ah. Uh, here we are. Light in the darkest night. But it's so interesting in verse 15 to see what God says to Moses. We don't have Moses saying this, don't see him saying this before. We see him standing up for God in the preceding nine verses, preceding 14 verses. And so you say to yourself, well, what? Why does God say this to Moses? Because the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Moses, you know, you ought to have known what you ought to do at this point. Now, God knows Moses really well. And Moses knows God pretty well, but not as well as he's supposed to. Because God says, you know what you ought to have done? Look at the very next phrase. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. I mean, look, Moses, right at this point, the cloud is in front of you. The Egyptians are behind you. So what are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be following the cloud. Which direction is the cloud going? But Lord, there's a sea there. Okay, Moses, let's try this again. You're supposed to be following the cloud. Which direction is the cloud going? But Lord, the sea is there. Okay, Moses, let's try this again. <laughs> you get the picture? Their job was not 
to scream and yell and kick and pout and fuss and grovel around on the ground and complain about they thought they were going to die. And Moses knew better. Moses knew you follow the cloud. But God doesn't spend much time on that. He just tells him what to do. Tell him we're going forward. March to the water. Lift thou up thy rod. Stretch out thine hand over the sea. So you got the rod here. You've got the hand here. And isn't this interesting? And divide it. Now you know Moses had never really seen that big of a miracle take place. Now he'd seen some pretty big miracles. He'd seen the ten plagues. He'd seen what God had done all over the land of Egypt. But like that? I mean, the river had turned to blood, but that, that's one thing, you know. But, but to divide the Red Sea at a place where it's 118 miles wide? You know what? Moses could have stood and argued. Moses does, on various occasions in his life, argue with God. He gets smacked around for doing it. But at this point, Moses really doesn't have any other options, does he? You know, you and I will come to points in our life when we have no other option than to obey. No matter how you feel about it emotionally, no matter how much you want to fuss about it, no matter how much you scream and yell and kick and pout and frown, no matter how much other people are pressuring you to do something, God's telling you to do something else. And your only option is to obey. Have you ever been there? I've been there a couple of times in my life. Notice what else God says. Not only are you going to divide, it says, the children of Israel shall go on really sticky, muddy ground, tripping over seashells and dead sharks. Is that what he says? I don't think so shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Not around the edge of the sea. Not in the marshes, which is where the liberals want to put you up in the north. Through the middle of the sea. The text is quite plain. We have a genuine miracle that is about to occur here, and Moses obeys. God doesn't do this kind of miracle at the command of a man in these days, though he did during the apostolic days. Because now he has given us his final word, and you and I are obligated, not just requested, we are obligated to know it and to obey it. Moses is the one through whom God wrote the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That hasn't been written yet. But you and I not only have the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, you and I have the entire Old Testament, you and I have the entire New Testament, we have the complete and finished revelation of God, and we have seen it fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, the living Word of God. If anybody had an excuse for not really understanding what God wanted him to do, Moses might have been the man especially faced with that kind of an obstacle in front of him. How much less excuse do you and I have when we have the Word of God in our own language and we've had it in freedom for our entire lives? So I think we cannot criticize Moses too much when God said to Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Then God says something else. It's the last time he's going to talk about this because he's done it before. In fact, he's done it multiple times before. God says in verse 17, Behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. You 
You know, you and I often pray that God will open the hearts of unsaved loved ones. That God will open their eyes to the light of the gospel of Christ. That God will somehow break down the walls that Satan has built where the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. But God, in his sovereignty, chooses to harden some hearts. In his eternal plan, we don't understand it all, but it's very clear. It's also clear that God holds men accountable for their hardness of heart. If you look up that phrase, hardness of heart, or harden the heart, you'll discover that many times in Scripture, not just with Pharaoh, many times men are upbraided for the hardness of their hearts because they have hardened their hearts. They are personally accountable. When you hear the word of God proclaimed on a subject which happens to be one of your personal pet sins, you have two options. You can either let the word of God penetrate you and bring you under conviction of that sin, whereby you weep as you kneel before a holy God and repent and confess your sins to him. And he shows you mercy and grace and lifts you back up and holds you close to himself. Or you can look at it and say, I'm enjoying my sin too much. And you harden your heart and you say, I will not repent. And you shake your fist in the face of God. And as you do, the light that you had gets darker and darker and you wander out into darkness thinking you're enjoying your sin and suddenly you see no more light. We're going to talk about that as we talk about light today. Light in the darkest night. That's what a believer who's walking in fellowship has. No matter how bad circumstances get, no matter how bad your surroundings, no matter how bad your personal life, no matter how bad your family, no matter how bad your friends, no matter how bad everything else, everybody is really, really getting down on you. It's a dark night, but you can have light. That's what we're talking about today. God talks about he will get honor upon all of the host of Egypt and then it says in verse 19 and the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them now you know it's rather interesting we'll read a little bit later about how Moses holds out his hand and how all night long God causes a wind to go across the sea to divide the sea it didn't just go like that like an elevator door but you know what Moses had to stand there on the beach with his hand outstretched with the rod of God in his hand as he saw God performing the miracle and embedding it deep in his heart. You know, it's interesting. God calls on Moses to do this at another time. Israel is deep in battle. Moses is on top of the mountain with Aaron and Hur. And he's a lot older at that point. He's getting tired. And he has to sit down on a, a rock. And whenever his hands drop down, Israel loses the battle. And when his hands are lifted, Israel wins. And so Joshua and her stand on each side of him holding up a hand. We're not told anything about that in the text, but I suspect... That might have been the kind of thing that would have happened. And you know what? Although Moses should have known because of the direction of the cloud, now the cloud's no longer in front of him. He's there and the cloud's behind him. The cloud is behind the entire camp. The cloud is now between the Egyptians and the Israelites. 
And all night long it's doing two things. We'll discover later in the text that it's not just giving darkness to the Egyptians, it's giving such darkness that they are afraid to move. They can't see their hand in front of their face. It's darkness that even if they try to light a match, they can't see the match. But that same Shekinah glory, the pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, that same Shekinah glory, at the same time, is giving light all night long to the children of Israel for getting their act together and getting ready to march across the sea. You know, there's something about the Shekinah. I'll give you a little preview of where we're going <laughs> in a few minutes that we have remaining. The Shekinah glory gives to us what it will be like in heaven and in hell. It will be darkness and flames that do not consume, but are very real and tormentous for the unbeliever, darkness and flames, but light and joy and blessing for the believers in heaven. And we'll discover in the book of Revelation where that light comes from. Back to our text. It was a cloud and darkness to them, that is to the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all night long. Now I had wanted, but I don't have time to do it today, to get a better understanding of how long it took to move a, a minimum of two million people at once. There's actually another passage in scripture, maybe we'll talk about it next week, where Moses is talking about the wilderness wanderings. And he actually gives us an average pace for packing up, breaking camp, moving out, stopping, and setting up camp before calling it a day. It's over in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. So if you want to jot that reference down, I encourage you to read it during the week. That way I don't have to spend a whole lot of time talking about it next year. But it actually gives you how long it would take them in a day. Look especially at verse 2. Because verse 2 tells you there are 11 days journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. So you can figure out how far is it from Mount Sinai, which is Horeb, all the way up to Kadesh Barnea, as long as you go by Mount Seir, which is in Edom. So, study verse 2. God also gives us, through the writings of Moses, also in Deuteronomy chapter 1, details about the route of the journey in verses 19 through 26. So, if you're jotting those down, verses 19 through 26 give you more details about the journey. We talked about a bunch of those in Numbers 33 last week. Then the passage continues just a few verses later, where Moses is reciting all the things that took place on that journey and how they abode in Kadesh many days, verse 46. So one of those stops was not just, we talked about an average of a year, it was a whole lot longer. And then finally we find in chapter 2 where God tells them to go north. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. I'm skipping a whole bunch of stuff, as you can see, dropping pages over here. <laughs> we also learned that the greatest amount of time in the wilderness was at Kadesh Barnea. That's for chapter 2 of Deuteronomy, verses 14 through 19. Okay, now back to the business of light. Light in the darkest night, the sermon for today. Light is one of the greatest themes and grandest themes of the Bible. Jesus Christ is the one who is the light that led Israel, guarded Israel, gave darkness to the Egyptians, revealed God to Israel. He's the one who reveals the Father to us. John 12, 46. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. That's Jesus speaking in John 12, 46. Jesus Christ, the light, is the one who fulfills the prophecies of bringing light to those who sat in darkness. We find this multiple times quoted out of the book of Isaiah in the New Testament. Matthew 4.16, Christmas narrative. We, people that sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, the light has sprung up. 
Luke quotes the same passage, Luke 179, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. He leads us. Luke 2.32, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Paul quotes it over in Acts chapter 13, same passage. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee a light to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Paul uses that passage in Acts chapter 26 as he preaches that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light to the people and to the Gentiles. Folks, that's why we have light today. We're among the Gentiles. Jesus is the light of the world. 2 Peter 1.19 we have also a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you, unto you do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. You see, Jesus himself is the light of which all the references to the Shekinah glory speak. When you see the Shekinah glory, think Jesus. Because it's very clear as you look into the New Testament, especially when you get to the book of Revelation, that Jesus Christ is the dweller in the light of the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah. That pillar that led them through the wilderness wanderings. John speaks of him as light in John 1. You know the passage. Beginning in verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Light and darkness. That's what we got with Israel, light and darkness for the Egyptians. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He, speaking of John the Baptist, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Ah. There's light given to every man. Did you know Pharaoh had had some light too? The ten plagues told him who God was. But he hardened his heart. When you hear the word of God preached as you are hearing it today, you are getting light. The question is, how will you respond to the light. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Chapter 3 of John's Gospel, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What's he talking about? Light is coming to the world. He's not talking about the sunlight outside, he's talking about Jesus came into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that's Jesus, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. You see, while Jesus was here, he himself was the light of the world of whom John is speaking in chapter 3. He says so in chapter 8. Jesus says, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Follows me, follow me, you'll get light. What did the children of Israel do all the way through the wilderness? What did they do in the wilderness wanderings? They followed the pillar of fire and cloud that gave them light. You know what Jesus is claiming here. Oh, they don't catch it. They don't pick up on it. They are in the business of hardening their hearts, just like Pharaoh did. Jesus' own people. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. You know, very interesting, if you look at that in Greek, he came unto his own things, that is, into the created world, and his own, that's his own ones, received him not. His own people received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus is taking us back to the wilderness wanderings in chapter 8. In chapter 9, he does the same thing. 
John chapter 9 verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That's Jesus. But did you know something? After he went back to heaven, he has called on us to reflect his light so that we, reflecting him, will be a light to all those around us as we walk through the darkness of the king of darkness and the kingdom of darkness. We are to be the lights. That's why he left you and me here. We're not to be smudge pots. We're supposed to be torches. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light, your light, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Jesus is the light, and as long as he was on earth, he was the light. But when he went away, you know what he's commanded us to be? We're supposed to be the lights through whom he shines. Luke says the same thing, quoting those same verses. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. When people see you, what should they be seeing? They should be seeing the light. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon housetops. You're supposed to be proclaiming the one who is the light. Luke also says that, Therefore whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. First John summarizes it for us in chapter 2, verse 8. And this is not a suggestion, this is a commandment. You know, you say, well, I'm not under the law, those Ten Commandments, the Old Testament. Okay, well, here's a new commandment. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Where is it supposed to shine? In me. In you. You know, we're called children of light in Scripture because a child always reflects the character of the Father. Luke 16, verse 8, The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. We're called children of light. And God says most of the time we're acting so stupid that the people around us are smarter than we are. In John 12, 36, While you have the light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. Ah, being children of light also relates to faith. He says, Believe in the light that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. How about a doctrinal epistle? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with one righteousness? Now get the last phrase. And what communion hath light with darkness? We're back in Exodus. Light versus darkness. You're children of light. The reason you're not to be yoked together with an unbeliever, and that's not merely in marriage, although that's a very good application and it's very evident, that many believers have disobeyed that. But that also means in business dealings. That also means, means in close personal friendships. That means in any way that you can be joined to an unbeliever. What communion has light with darkness? You're supposed to be lights to them, not joined to them. While Jesus was on earth, the light of the Shekinah glory was seen in him. For example, at the transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. What's happening? The Shekinah glory is appearing. And who appears with Jesus in the Shekinah? Moses and Elijah. 
Moses, who followed the Shekinah glory, is seen with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in the light. That's where we're going someday, folks. That's where my mom went last night. She's in the glory with Jesus. Have you lost a loved one who's a believer? They're in the light with Jesus. Jesus is the source of all of our spiritual light. That is our salvation and sanctification. Paul preaching in Acts 26 verse 18 to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. He talks first about salvation and about sanctification and he ties both of those things in turning from darkness to light. 1 Timothy 6.16 Oh, marvelous statement that Paul gives to Timothy, speaking of our Lord, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. But light is not only a picture for us of salvation and sanctification. Jesus as the light is also the source of our fellowship. First John chapter 1, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. Remember what they're doing? They're walking in the light in the Old Testament. Following the Shekinah, if they stood still, it would go and they'd soon be in darkness. If they turned and went the other direction, they'd be in darkness. If they shut their eyes, they'd be in darkness. If they stamped their feet and rebelled and went a different direction, they'd be in darkness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. He's not only the source of our spiritual light for salvation and sanctification, he is a source of light for our fellowship. Chapter 2, verse 9 of 1 John, he that saith he's in the light and hateth his brother is in the darkness even until now. In other words, what you do tells whether or not, and it can tell everybody else around you, whether or not you're in the light or in the darkness. Chapter 2, verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Light is not only for our salvation, sanctification, and fellowship. It is also what characterizes our spiritual armor. Did you know that? You know the list of spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. But did you know that light is what characterizes our spiritual armor? Romans chapter 13, verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. There's so much more I want to say. We've only gotten halfway through the light. <laughs> Haven't even talked about those three or four pages that I skipped there at the very beginning. About other details about the, the journey, maybe we'll pick those up as we move across the Red Sea. But, folks... Our Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world. I want to talk about how he was the light that hit Paul on the road to Damascus. He's the light who is the judge. He's the creator of physical light and it reflects his glory and character. The New Testament tells us that. I'm just going to jump down to the very last one. He's not only our light now, but he will be our light in heaven for all of eternity. Colossians 1.12 Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet that is, he's fitted us out to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's where they are now. 1 John 1.5 This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And yet Jesus said, I am the light. What does that tell you about Jesus? I am the light of the world. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. In the Revelation chapter 7, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them or any heat. And the light of the candles shall shine no more in thee, speaking of Babylon, and the voice of the bridegroom, and the bride shall be heard no more in thee. 
Speaking of how God removes the light from those who are walking in darkness, for thy merchants were the great men of earth, and by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And then he speaks of heaven. In chapter 21, the new Jerusalem, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a precious stone, even unto a jasper stone clear as crystal, crystal. And the city had no need of the sun, now listen carefully, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and listen to the last phrase, and the Lamb, that's Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor unto it. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. Who did it just say was the light? And here it says he's the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Jesus, the resident of the Shekinah glory, is the light. He is the one who led Israel across the Red Sea and through the wilderness. And dearly beloved, he's the one who leads us all the way. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that Jesus is the light of the world. He is the one who is the light of the new Jerusalem. That's why they don't need the sun or the moon. And we're told clearly that the Lord God gives them light. He is the one who is our Lord, our King, our God. He was the one who was the Redeemer of Israel in the Old Testament. He's the one who declared as he walked on earth, I am the light of the world. He's the one who has told us that after he left that we are the lights of the world because we are to reflect him. And as others watch us, as they hear our words, as they perceive our attitudes and our motives, as they examine our actions, either they will see light or darkness. Jesus is our light for salvation. He is our light for sanctification. He is our light for fellowship as we walk with him. He is the light that shines from the spiritual armor that you've given to us to be clothed in, that we might fight against all the wiles of the devil. Jesus is the light. Thank you, Father, for your word and for its power. We pray for your blessings that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.